recently I was looking through a list of the 101 greatest painters of all time, and something stood out. Of the 101, only three were women. Two of the female painters are 20th century artists, Georgia O'Keeffe and Frida Kahlo. In fact, I'll never forget Georgia O'Keeffe saying that she preferred painting flowers to human models. Why? Because they're cheaper and they don't move. But the third artist, who was she? Well, to find this intriguing woman who shattered every glass ceiling in the art world, you have to go back almost 400 years. Today on Masterstroke, the story of the greatest artist you've probably never heard of. Let's go inside and discover the astonishing story of the remarkable Artemisia Gentileschi. Imagine you're a 10-year-old girl living in Rome at the beginning of the 17th century. And oh yes, your dad happens to be friends with the great Caravaggio, the most famous artist in the world at the time. Well, that's the world that Artemisia Gentileschi lived in. When Artemisia was only 12, her mother died. This left her the only girl in a family of three brothers and her father. She didn't leave her home much, and we know that as a teenager, she was yet to learn to read well or to write. She spent her days inside learning to paint. But she needed broader instruction. So her father hired Agostino Tassi. Tassi's specialty was the painting of elaborate architectural scenes. He was to instruct Artemisia in the use of perspective. But Tassi, it turned out, was a despicable character. He forced himself on the 17-year-old Artemisia. Then he promised to marry her. But Tassi didn't marry Artemisia. When he reneged on his promise, he was charged in court for what he'd done. Incredibly, the transcript of that trial, 400 years ago, it still survives. So we know exactly what was said. The trial lasted an exhausting seven months. And as in many cases today, instead of focusing on the reprehensible nature of Tassie, much of the focus was on discrediting the victim. There was nothing Tassie wasn't prepared to say to get out of the charge. Artemisia was subjected to vile examinations. And then Artemisia was taken and she was tortured with thumbscrews. You see, the theory of the day was this. Torture would determine whether her accusation was accurate. But Tassi, <laughs> he wasn't tortured. You see, it was a man's world, and Tassi was well-connected. She withstood every slander against her, the public humiliation, the trauma of reliving the attack in a very public forum. And eventually, Tassi was convicted for his crime. This is the upper section of Artemisia's first major work, which is entitled Susanna and the Elders. It's a work with deep symbolic meaning. And in a remarkable artistic achievement, she produced this work when she was only 17 years old. It was a foretaste of both her genius and her strength of character. Susanna and the Elders is a story which generally doesn't appear in the Hebrew and Protestant versions of the Book of Daniel. It was written in Greek and it was most likely added to some manuscripts long after the original book was complete. Today we might call it fan fiction. Someone who clearly loved the original wrote an edition true to its style and values. In fact, the Church of England lists this story in their 39 articles, not for biblical doctrine, but as an instruction for life and instruction of manners. 
For Artemisia, the story of Susanna and the elders, it perfectly expressed how she felt and what she had experienced. In the story, two elders try to coerce a young woman. When she refuses, they accuse her of inappropriate behaviour. In this story, Daniel the prophet investigates a case. He discovers the elders are lying and they're both put to death, while Susanna is exonerated. Now, in this painting, there are two fascinating details which Artemisia includes. While some earlier paintings had the elders looking at Susanna from afar, in Artemisia's rendition, the men are in close proximity to Susanna. You feel her vulnerability. It has a very visceral, somewhat creepy effect on the viewer. Looking at the painting, we feel a sense of violation and repulsion. And do you see the man on the left whispering in the other man's ear? Well, some scholars note that he bears a striking resemblance to Tassie. It's sometimes claimed the Bible represses women, and some have read it that way. But when we dig deeper, there's another way to read it. And that's the way that Artemisia understood the Bible and chose to reflect it in her paintings. Even if the story of Susanna is a later edition and not part of the true Bible, the story is interesting partly because it expresses the values laid out in the Law of Moses. The Law of Moses instituted the highest penalty available against those who exploit women death. But could respected elders really expect to be prosecuted under biblical law? Some modern critics scoff at the idea. After all, even today, we frequently hear stories of powerful men in politics, entertainment, and even religion who get away with years of exploiting women. If you're powerful enough, famous enough, wealthy enough, or religious enough, the law simply doesn't seem to apply. In contrast, the Bible lays out swift and dire punishment, even for those in powerful positions. For example, the greatest Israelite king of all, King David, was publicly and severely punished for the wrong he did to Bathsheba. The Bible is clear. All are equal before the law. All are protected by that law no matter how powerful the perpetrator is. In the Old Testament, the Bible highlights the devout character and extraordinary achievements of many women. We have the prophet Miriam during the Exodus, the prophet and judge Deborah, who provides leadership to the people of Israel, and to Artemisia, who loved women of integrity and tenacity, the hero of all Old Testament heroes, was Esther. In fact, of the 34 paintings which are still with us today, one third of them feature Jewish heroines such as Esther. When you enter the Metropolitan Museum in New York, one of the first paintings which confronts you is this one. It's Artemisia's Baroque painting, Esther before Ahasuerus. Here we see a splendidly dressed king who is perched on his golden throne. Esther, risking death, approaches the king to plead for her people. The prominent use of space in the centre of the work, it demonstrates the gap in power between king and queen. It adds to the drama. Like other artists of her era, Artemisia paints Esther fainting before the king. Why? Well, possibly because she's downright terrified. However, it's been suggested that Artemisia is demonstrating the wisdom and strength of the queen. You see, by her swooning actions, the king is about to rise to his feet. He's about to assist his wife and ultimately provide clemency in support of her request. Here was a courageous woman who dared to speak up and be used by God to save the lives of her people. Evidence indicates that Artemisia was a practicing Christian. 
So to understand her ideas and her artistic themes, it's important to explore the teachings of Jesus on the value of women. Jesus confronted his own culture's mistreatment of women. He stopped the stoning of a woman and he condemned the men involved. He treated women like his friends Mary and Martha in the same way that he treated their brother. He had women who followed him and shared their faith in him. And at his crucifixion, women played a key role supporting him. And the first people to be told that Jesus had risen, women. This is a fascinating painting. It has the simple title, Mary Magdalene. It shows Mary at the empty tomb of Jesus. When I lived in London, every week I'd go into the National Gallery and make my way over to see this painting. The artist was Giovanni Savoldo. He was a Renaissance painter who worked about a hundred years before Artemisia. Now I find this painting engaging for a number of reasons. Firstly, on its own, it's a strikingly beautiful piece. When you stand in the gallery, the silver luster and her gaze towards you, they capture your attention. We can see the red clothing, which symbolises her sinful past. It's just peeking out from underneath her silver cloak, while Mary's anointing jar is placed right there beside her. In the background is a lake. There are dark and light clouds in the sky. But there's something else I want to point out. God could have chosen anyone to be the first person on earth to witness the risen Jesus. For reasons of his own choosing, he chose two women, one of whom was Mary. In the New Testament, the term apostle refers to someone who witnesses the risen Christ and was commissioned to tell others about it. Mary was the first apostle in history, which caused one theologian to comment that Mary was the apostle to the apostles. Or put another way, she was the witness to all the other followers of Jesus. In the Christian church, women were to play a very different role in society than they had ever played before. Now let's take a closer look at the painting. I want you to notice the way the light is falling. What Zavaldo has done here is nothing short of brilliant artistry. Mary sitting at the tomb. But something has surprised her from behind. And that something is brightly illuminated. Notice the light shimmering, not from directly behind her, but from nearly in front of her as she turns the lights on her arm and her head covering, but it hasn't yet reached her eyes. What or who is it? This is the moment that Mary turns to see what the light is. She's curious. She turns slowly. The next instant after this scene, Mary becomes what may just be the very first person in history to look into the face of the resurrected Jesus. Now for a Christian, there's simply no greater honour. The biblical book of Acts, which describes the early church, talks of many prominent Christian women leaders. In addition, Christianity prohibited a number of practices that harmed women. For example, Christianity outlawed adultery for both men and women, a novel concept even in many cultures today where female adultery is harshly punished, but male adultery, well, it's an accepted practice. Christians also did away with polygamy, an arrangement that disempowers women. Christians worked to end the commercial exploitation of women, and they also worked to end the practice of infant homicide, a custom that was common in pagan Rome. 
because sons were prized over daughters, a disproportionate number of Roman baby girls were murdered soon after birth. This resulted in 131 males to every 100 females in pagan Rome. From these promising beginnings, how then did Christianity become associated with bad treatment of women? The same way it became associated with so many other evils. Christians became corrupted by the world around them. They imported pagan customs and they let the sinful temptation to suppress others control them. But the story of Christianity and women is filled with good news. Wherever Christianity spread, women were educated and empowered. God loves and cherishes women. He made men and women different, but equal. And he expects everyone to treat women fairly and with dignity. When I consider my wife, I see her through the eyes of love which Jesus has given me. I want to treat Coralie like Jesus treated women, with respect, love, and a demonstration that she's of infinite value. Artemisia understood the value Jesus saw in women, and she reflected that in her painting, Christ and the Samaritan Woman at the Well. Unlike her father's rendition, which portrays a disinterested or downcast woman being told a thing or two by Jesus, Artemisia represents Jesus and this woman in deep conversation. The woman is not just intrigued by what Jesus is saying. As she leans forward, her openness reflects the trust that she's already developed in him. In a culture where the disciples were astonished that Jesus would even talk with this woman, Artemisia is captivated by this thought, that Christ's most extended discussion with anyone in the Gospels is with this woman. Now let's take a look at another of Artemisia's paintings, probably her most famous. Even with all these years separating us from Artemisia, it's an understatement to say that we can feel the powerful passions playing out in this scene. The painting presents the climactic scene of Judas slaying the Assyrian general Holofernes. Like Susanna and the elders, this is a narrative that was not included in the Hebrew scriptures, but it was a tale that Artemisia identified with and used to portray her own tragic story. Historians suggest that this painting may have reflected her cathartic attempts to deal with her own pain through seeking divine justice against the monster who abused her. You see, after the seven-month trial against the man who raped Artemisia, the court found Tassie guilty. But his sentence was commuted. Think about that for a minute. In the trial, it came out that Tassie most likely had murdered his wife and that he'd raped both of his sister-in-laws. Tassie was a predator of the worst order, and yet he walked away with a slap on the wrist. Can you see why Artemisia needed to express her desire for justice through her art? So let's come to the painting. The story goes that the men of Israel were so afraid of the army led by the Assyrian leader Holofernes, they refused to fight. Judith took matters into her own hands. As Margaret Thatcher once quipped, if you want something said, ask a man. If you want something done, ask a woman. The men talked, but Judith acted. Along with her maidservant, she went to Holofernes' camp. When she entered the Assyrian general's tent, he subsequently drank himself senseless. And then he stretched out on his bed, overcome by alcohol. At this moment of vulnerability, Judith acted decisively to protect her people. This story closely mirrors the events of Jael and Sisera in the Old Testament book of Judges. In that situation, 
which by the way, was also graphically painted by Artemisia, a woman named Jael hammers a tent peg through the sleeping head of an enemy general who was bent on destroying Israel. <laughs> and they say the Bible's boring. Artemisia was hardly the first artist to take on the story of Judith. Indeed, the great Caravaggio, he painted his own version. And a superficial glance at both the paintings indicates that they're roughly analogous. But closer inspection reveals very important differences. There's something that strikes immediately that distinguishes this painting from all preceding representations of the scene. It's the strength of the women. In many earlier representations, the women look frail, demure, hesitant. In Artemisia's version, the women are strong, determined and purposeful. They know what they have to do to save their people and they aren't shying away from getting stuck in and doing it. These are women who work together. They've carried heavy loads, shouldered serious responsibilities. These are women who get things done, even when the men around them quake. Artemisia is now recognised as one of the top 101 artists in history. But her unusual skills were identified early by her father. He wrote to the Grand Duchess of Tuscany that Artemisia, having turned herself to the profession of painting, has in three years so reached the point that I can venture to say that today she has no peer. Now that's a big thing to say especially when we remember that he himself was a successful professional artist. He's admitting in this letter that his young daughter has already surpassed his artistic achievements. And objectively, he was right. He was a good painter, no doubt. But Artemisia, she had the rare quality of greatness. Overwhelmingly, Artemisia painted scenes with female protagonists. She painted women in a voice of authenticity that had never been seen before and arguably has never been surpassed. Her exceptional talent was recognised when she was made the first woman to be accepted into the Florentine Academy of the Arts. We know from her letters she worked as a freelance artist all her life, despite the financial insecurity that accompanied that course that she did so successfully in an art world dominated by men is a tribute both to her artistic genius but also to her exceptional strength of character. Later in life, her fame was of such magnitude that England's King Charles I invited her to paint for his court. She travelled to England where she joined her father and the two again painted together. During her time in England, she painted this piece entitled Self-Portrait as the Allegory of Painting. What I see in this painting is confidence and honesty. Here's a woman at the height of her artistic powers. She's striving to use her remarkable God-given talent to pursue excellence. She isn't looking at us to impress us. She's focused on the work. She isn't bowed by the adversity she's faced. She's strong. She isn't trying to conform to any kind of societal strictures of who she should be. She's serious, dedicated, focused. She is who she is. And ultimately, who she is, is an exquisitely talented artist whose faith, strength of character, and determination projected her to greatness. I take a lot from Artemisia's art, but knowing all that she overcame to produce it, that gives it an even more special meaning. Remember, she lost her mother young. She was raped by Tassie. She was then tortured. And after all that, 
she was never treated fairly by the powerful people in her society. But here is the wonder of her story. Ultimately, Artemisia, the defiant survivor and artistic trailblazer, she succeeded. Hers is an inspiring story of triumph over adversity. And it's a story of courage that God wants to give to you and me. The entire story of the Bible is about real human beings like Artemisia, who deal with the very real challenges that face humanity today. After all, we all have our struggles. For many of us, there are hard things to deal with from our upbringing. Most of us hit barriers in life and have to face down bullies. We all experience discouragement and difficulties. The message of the Bible is this, no matter what happens to us, God loves. And no matter how unjust our society might be, God is perfectly just and He will vindicate the innocent at the judgment. And no matter how beaten down we are, God is always ready to give us a hand up. In fact, God loves it when we push through the barriers to use the talents that He's given us. Jesus told an interesting parable about talents. In the story, a king gives three people talents. He then goes away. When he comes back, he praises those who have used their talents, but he castigates those who failed to. Well, the message is simple. Whether our talent is painting, writing, computing, caring, teaching, building, singing, filmmaking, whatever it is, God has given us our talents for a reason, to use them and no one has the right to try to suppress our God-given talents. Artemisia used her talents to the glory of God, despite all the odds. <laughs> Maybe God smiled when He saw Artemisia scale the heights of artistic greatness, while all those who mistreated her faded into obscurity. Today, you can see Artemisia's works in the greatest galleries on earth, and more than that, you can find her example of courage and overcoming in the hearts of everyone who knows her story. The life of Artemisia inspires me to not let anyone or anything get in the way of using the talents I've been given to the glory of God. I hope her masterstroke story inspires you too.